So that's for me for the introduction, and I'm looking forward to, to your talk. Thank you, Cornelius. Much appreciated. Uh, I should say that book was published in 2018. It's the second edition of the, of the Anthropology of Modern Teeth, which was originally published in 1997. Now, there are two ways to look at dental morphology. Dentists look at uh, basically the normal form of teeth. And so you can see this comes from a dental anatomy book. And, uh, you know, you, for the most part, there's a predictable number of cusps and roots associated with each tooth. What we are interested in are the variants uh, associated with, with normal form. And, uh, like for example, we look at a lot of presence absent traits that are variable when present. And shovel-shaped incisors, of course, are a classic example of that. You can see that up here where you go from no shoveling to incredibly pronounced shoveling. Uh, so extra ridges, tubercles, major cusps, root number, which I know Cornelius is interested in. Uh, these are the things that we tend to focus on. And in population studies, traditionally, we have compared sample frequencies. So say the frequency of shovel-shaped incisors in the Polynesians is one thing, in Africans it's another. So we would compare frequencies between groups. But today, there's, we're going to be talking in part about another way to do population studies. So these are, this is just a, a sample of the kinds of traits we look at. Uh, we've already talked about shuffling, pig reduced, missing, uh, upper, more, upper third molars, incisor winging, two root lower canines, one of my favorite traits, because it's one of the few things that Europeans can brag about. European teeth are incredibly boring, as you'll <laughs> see in a bit. Uh, Asians have all the bells and whistles and they left us out. Uh, Cus six, that's a great trait. Oh, I wish I could tell you about the Utah's taken premolar, but there's not time. Uh, Carabellic's cusp, that's a famous one. Uh, they used to think that's, that was a hallmark of Europeans, but it is not. And uh, four cusps, lower second molars, now that is a hallmark of Europeans. So we'll, oops. I just want to talk just a little bit about genetics because uh, teeth are under incredibly strong genetic control because in nature, you know, if you lose your teeth, you know, most animals, when they lose their teeth, that's it. Humans, of course, have overcome that problem. You know, you can survive uh, losing all your teeth with dentures and things, but elephants don't have that option. Have you ever seen elephant dentures? No, no, you have not. So when they spit out that sixth tooth, they're done. And they have to go off to this elephant graveyard. Okay, you can see these are two monozygotic twins. And if you look at them closely, say, my God, no, they're, they're exactly the same. There's only one little thing that you can find that's different. The eruption of the canine is just off just a little bit. But other than that, you look at all the fine details, and it is exactly the same. But that's not always the case. Here's another example of monozygotic twins, where Carabelli's trait right here and right here is a bit different. Even the eruption is a bit different. And so we've known for a long time that there were environmental factors uh, that would cause, say, asymmetry between the left and right sides and also discordance in twins. But we would just attribute that, like I say, to general environmental factors. Now we're looking at it more in terms of epigenetics. And uh, I think that is really the, going to be useful to help explain asymmetry between traits, left right asymmetry, and discordance in monozygotic twins, which I think may be caused by the same factors. So these traits are quasi they're not simple Mendelian dominance, dominant recessive traits. That's what uh, Christy Turner wanted me to find when I analyzed families in my dissertation. And I kept you know, 
as in many things, I, I came up with answers that uh, didn't agree with Christie's perceptions, but he adapted. You know, I said, you know, I found in families and populations their quasi-continuous traits with polygenic modes of inheritance. Now we know that there are some major single nucleotide polymorphisms that are linked to some of these. And I'll talk about that a bit at the very end, if I get to the end. Okay, in so far as the people in the Americas go, Alistair Lichka, who was kind of the father of physical anthropology in North America, although his name is not viewed very favorably these days, but I don't want to get into that. Uh, in 1920, he published a paper in shovel-shaped incisors and noted the, the difference between uh, Europeans and Africans versus Asians and other uh, derived populations. I always could say Asian and Asian derived populations. I don't use yellow brown people. That doesn't sound very good. Okay, this is my mentor, Christy Turner. <clears throat> Prior to Turner's work, uh, uh, the field was dominated by dentists. Now, dentists are fine, they know their teeth, but they don't always think anthropologically. Uh, Al Dahlberg and Pio Pedersen, I've worked with both of those guys, and they did great dental work, but they just didn't think about anthropological problems. So that's what Christie thought about. How do you address anthropological problems with teeth? So in his dissertation, he studied the tooth crown and root morphology of Eskimo Aleuts. And uh, one funny thing, Cornelius would get a kick out of this. You know who was on his committee? One member, J.T. Robinson. And J.T. Robinson, a very famous paleoanthropologist who worked with Broome in South Africa, uh, uh, he just about wouldn't pass Christie because Chris, Christie argued that the differences between Aleuts and Eskimos was because of genetic drift. And back in those days, uh, Robinson, all the British school, they were staunch adaptationists. And so they thought everything that was tied to adaptation. Whereas Sewell Wright, you know, developed the concept of genetic drift. And, and so <laughs> Christie employed that and to tell you the truth, Christie won out on that argument. Okay, in 1970, when I was a grad student, he, he got a grant to develop the first two plaques of ASU DAS for CUS 6 and CUS 7. And the first plaques were pretty fancy. They were made in a, a acrylic and on a plastic base. We would etch in the, the numbers and CUS name with a Leroy lettering set. This is so primitive. I'm sure many of you have no idea what I'm even talking about. But, uh, these were mass produced and sent around the world free of charge. So nobody was paying for these. Eventually, it became such a big deal that he did, it, did them in plaster. And uh, whenever anybody would uh, write and say, hey, we'd like a set of these, uh, somebody in the lab would put together a set and mail them. So uh, it was quite an operation. Uh, there I am when I was your age, this is like in 1969, long, probably about the time your parents were born. But uh, you can see here I am grinding these teeth. And here's grade one, grade two, grade three. I'm still working on grade zero there, obviously, uh, putting those plaques together. I thought you did a kick out of saying how all this started, which happened a long time ago. It's come a long way, baby, because now this set of plaques is distributed by bone clones. And this was Christo Janaski, not me, that uh, called it the Turner Scott system. Because Chris was really mad at ASU for a variety of reasons, which I could explain sometime. And uh, in 1991, uh, Christie wrote this article that has been cited well over a thousand times on the methods of observing tooth crown and root morphology. <clears throat> but it only had four illustrations because it was in an edit, a, a edited volume that had limitations on figures. Uh, when Joel Irish and I did this in uh, 
2017, there was no limit, basically. We had 242 illustrations. And so I, w I wish Cambridge would give me a chance to update this, because, man, I've seen a lot of stuff since 2017. Okay, in, in the first edition, uh, we, we, developed, we had to have some organization, organizational scheme to talk about the variation. Cavalli Sports, uh, uh, in, in the history and geography of human genes in 1994, he got around the problem of race by doing things by continent. But when he did things by continent, like for, for Africa, for example, he did the genetics of Africa, and when he did a big dendrogram, what do you get? You get psh, North Africa, psh, South Africa. So he was avoiding the problem. I hate that uh, race is such a hot topic these days. I know people don't like the word, but so I chicken out and call it the, the subdivisions of humankind. But there is pattern uh, variation. And I've looked at groups from this whole area. This is Western Eurasia. And that's not just Europe. It's also India and North Africa. And then Sub-Saharan Africa, they have their own suite of dumb characteristics. And Sino-America, it broadly ties East and North Asia into the Americas. Then Southeast Asia and the Pacific, or especially Polynesia. And then Austral Melanesia, which is Australia, New Guinea, and Big Island Melanesia. And so those were the organizational principles. And I'll show you just a few examples of variation. So here's the shoveling plaque I developed as a grad student. I, I, I've seen grade seven, but I couldn't come up with a good example. Uh, but this shows the variation. <clears throat> These were the box whisker plots in the second edition. The first edition, there were a few issues that, that were weird, but what I did in this case, I put Africa and Western Eurasia and then Central Asia between Western Eurasia and Sino-America, and then Jomon Ainu between uh, Sino-America and Sumba Pacific, and then Sahu Pacific down in the bottom. So all the box whisker plots look exactly like this. And I, I'm just going to show you a few just to illustrate the nature of variation. So with shoveling, you can see it's very dramatic. Europeans and Africans are about the same. Uh, East Asians and Native Americans basically have all grade two and above shoveling. Southeast Asians are intermediate as are Australians and Melanesians. New Guinea is very low though. But you can see here Central Asia. It, this is what I was telling you before, and that's just one example. Uh, right between Europe and East Asia. This shows the distributions of these uh, groups. Europe, Africa, and India, the Western Eurasian groups. The modal expression is grade one. In Southeast Asia, Australia, etc. the modal expression is grade two. In East Asia, Native Americans, the modal expression is grade three. So those distributions are pretty cool. Okay, bilateral winging, one of my favorite traits. You, you see this a ton in South American natives. Uh, this is regular, a little winging, moderate, and very pronounced winging. You can see it's rare in Europe and Africa, and the highest in Mesoamerica and South America, also very high in North America. Again, intermediate in Southeast Asia, not too common in South Pacific. Just for Cornelius, uh, two rooted upper first premolars. Look at this, Native Americans, Northeast Asians through South America, almost all single rooted teeth. Whereas in Europe, about 40% are two rooted like this. And in Africa, it's more like 60% are two rooted. So it's a pretty dramatic contrast. And then cut six, Again, Africa and Europe pretty low. Asia and the New World high. And Southeast Asia also very high. But look at New Guinea. New Guinea is weird. 
And Australia and Melanesia are way up there. And then three root core first molars. This is uh, one of the key traits that Christie started with uh, when he addressed people in problems. And you can see it's a, an accessory distal lingual root. And it's, oops. It's, I mean, I don't think, these data are from Joel Irish, and I'm not sure Joel has ever seen it. In Europe, I have seen it maybe two or three times in a few thousand individuals. But you can see in East Asia, Northeast Siberia, and American Arctic, it's about 20 to 30 percent. In Alliance, it can be over 50 percent. And you can see in Northwest Coast, Intermediate, Native Americans about 5 to 7 percent. Southeast Asia is intermediate again. Okay, so I just gave you a few to illustrate how, how these things vary. In terms of people in the New World, this was one of the earliest articles. Well, it may be the earliest article <clears throat> Christie published on this, 1971. Uh, he used three rooted lower first molars to propose why is that? To propose a three-way model for the people in the Americas. And he said basically, uh, Amaranth had a frequency of about 5%, uh, Nadine about 15 to 20%, and Eskimo Alley it's 30 to 35%. And that was the first thing based on one trait. And there it was. And there's Christie. He was always so happy when he looked at teeth. In, in his lifetime, well, see, he was a, he, he started at Cal Berkeley, but he left Berkeley after three years and went to ASU and was there for like 40 years. And if you've ever been to Tempe, Arizona, you know it's always a good idea to get the hell out of town in the summer because it is so hot. And so that's when he traveled the world, going to museums everywhere. And I think he scored like 25,000 individuals. Well, we love teeth. Okay, this was a, a, a very major paper that's been cited many times, this paper in Current Anthropology, where, where Christie collaborated with Joe Greenberg, who was a very famous linguist, and Steve Zadura, who was not as famous geneticist, but they basically said they saw the same pattern of a, a differentiation between Eskimo Aleuts, Nadine, and Amaranth. And, uh, <coughs> and so Christie also had this notion that Asia was divided into two dental patterns, Sinodonte and Sundodonte. And Sinodonte was the, like East and Northeast Asians in the New World where trade frequencies were elaborated. You could see that in some box whisker plots, that Native Americans and East Asians had, had, they had the same traits, but in much higher frequencies in Southeast Asians. So this was the, the general dendrogram uh, that uh, Christie developed, showing again macro-Indians right here, not in a greater Northwest Coast right here, and then Eskimo Aliens right here. And then based on that, he proposed that the earliest migration of macro Indians came so, I don't know, he used Upper Cave as a reference, but as we'll see in a minute, Upper Cave was not a good reference. But he thought macro Indians came first, then the Nadine came from Juktai, and the Eskimo Aleuts came out of the Amur River area following the coast and got into the New World that way. And he was never sure. He always thought that Amherst got here first, but he was never sure if Eskimo Aleuts or Nadine got here second. And uh, things are now a little bit different, though. In 2008, Christy and I wrote an article together in honor of Bill Workman. And, uh, Basically, he wanted to re, how do you say it, just basically review what he'd been saying for 30 years. But I started, I did the writing, and when he read it, he said, well, Richard, maybe you should be first author. 
because this did not exactly agree with his worldview. So <clears throat> the problem is not an A intermediacy, because if those groups came out of the same common ancestor at one time, they should all be equally distant from one another, but they are not. It's more like this, where AB equals AC, and AC, those are greater than BC. And so these were the alternate <coughs> models. This did not work. There were various reasons. You're going to see that we often have dendrograms that look exactly like that, where Eskimo Alley, not in a greater northwest coast cluster, and then Amherst. But then here we have Eskimo Aleuts and Nadine with American Indian. And here we have Eskimo Aleut, Nadine with gene flow with American Indians. And here Eskimo Aleut, Nadine with American Indian, but gene flow between Eskimo Aleuts and Nadine. There are various genes, I don't have time to go into it, that almost certainly indicate that the situation was like this, where uh, Eskimo Alley, not an A, shared a common ancestor more recently than they did with Amerins, but there was definitely gene flow in Canada and in the Western, well, somewhere in Canada, because they share one gene in common that you just cannot explain without gene flow, and that's between Algonquins and not an A, and it's an albumin miscopy or an albumin Algonquin. Both of them have it, three to five percent, nobody else has it, except through gene flow. So there was definitely a gene flow in the subarctic. Okay, a, a few years ago, <clears throat> Gary Haynes, who some of you may be familiar with because he wrote a book called The Settlement of the Americas, and he was always the, the guy that was putting up the Clovis first fight and uh, so he fought hard against Monte Verdi and all these other early sides, but eventually lost the battle. But he was a stubborn guy, but he, he was a, he's a great guy, great science, very rigorous. But uh, there was a, a symposium in his honor, and I had to do a paper, and so I'm not a taphonomist, that's one of his big things, but I, so I thought I could do something on the people in the New World. And that led to something that I didn't really anticipate. And uh, this was published in QI in 2018. And this involves what is called the Beringian standstill or the Beringian incubation model. Now there is one thing about Native Americans that Christie didn't fully understand because he, he thought that Eskimo Aleuts were closer to East Asians than Amorites, but it turns out that's not exactly true. He also thought that East Asia clustered with all the Amorites and Southeast Asia was Sundakons, and they were different. But the difference between East Asians and Native Americans is so dramatic, they almost had to have been isolated for eight to 10,000 years for those differences to develop. And that happened up in the north, way up in the north. Now, I don't know if many of you have heard of the Yana Rhino, uh, the Yana Rhino Horn site. Have you guys heard of that? It's over, it's at 70, it's on the Lena River. It's at 71 degrees, which is way up there. It's over 30,000 years old. and. It, interestingly, they found two teeth from Yana, but they are not, the, genetically, they're not linked to Native Americans. They're linked to Western Eurasians. And that's really an interesting story I don't have time to go into, but, but the ancestors of Native Americans got up there into the, probably this Arctic plain. They couldn't move into the New World because of ice sheets and coastal glaciers. And so they didn't really, now, now <laughs> I don't want to get into the, the footprints and the white sands and how early things were, so I'm gonna stick to 
what I have, but that, that's an interesting story about the possibility of an earlier migration into the New World that we really can't see very well. Okay, so memorize all these numbers. I just wanted to show you what, see these are the frequencies of the trades, and, base, and K is, uh, there are 135 samples. This is K, this is not N. So this is based on the averages of 15 samples, 15 samples, you get 11 samples, etc. So these estimates are pretty darn good. And so this is a distance matrix that shows, uh, you know, if when you transform those frequencies into the di pairwise distances. And I just wanted you to, to note this one in particular. You see the distances of East Asia from Eskimo Aleuts, Nadine, North America, Mesoamerica, South America, boy, Southeast Asia. So you can see East Asia is much closer to Southeast Asia than it is to any Native American group. And when we did this, see, this was published in 2018. Christy died in 2013. Uh, I don't know what Christy would have thought about this because it was based on his data. He made the observations, but, well, the way he analyzed it was not a little different. In any event, you can see in this case, up here is New Guinea and Australia. Here we have Central Asia and Europe, which is kind of odd. They're kind of East Asia, Southeast Asia, and Polynesia. And down here are all these Native American groups. You can see not a Native Eskimo Aleut clustered together. So, you know, even even with admixture, they have to cluster somehow. And the geneticists find basically exactly the same thing: not a Native and Eskimo Aleut clustering together. This just shows the ordination of the same thing. All the Native Americans up here, East Asia in the middle. Australia, New Guinea, way down there. This one involves temporal samples. You see Southeast Asia late and early, East Asia, Australia. New Guinea is way off there. And then all the Native Americans here in North Nodden and Eskimo Alley going together. So they do not cluster with East Asians. And I, this is one of my favorite uh, diagrams with these big balls. <laughs> big shiny balls, look at New Guinea. Big a golden ball, Australia down here. But look at this, Southeast Asia early, Southeast Asia late, East Asia. This is what I'm working on right now because I, I just submitted an abstract to AABA called Sayonara Sundadanti because I think Sundadanti, those folks in Southeast Asia are actually a blend of East Asians and Austral Melanesians. And we're worth it. It's, it's a long story as to how I arrived at that conclusion, but it's very interesting. And so when you looked at genetics, this article was published in 93, and I always thought, this is crazy. How are Native Americans way down here? All the East Asians are up here and everything. That, again, that's Beringian standstill stuff. Okay, so. Quickly, Southeast Asia and East Asia differences are very minor. New World groups accentuate the form of Sinodonti. Sinodon, oops, oops, oops. Sinodonts and steroids. New World populations tend to be internally consistent and in contrast East and Southeast Asia. No support for Sinodonti in the New World despite a few articles claiming that. Believe me, there is no evidence of that. And most are consistent with the Beringian standstill model. Okay, we're, I, I'm part of what's called the Beringian Working Group. And we have archeologists, geneticists, paleoecologists. I'm the dental anthropologist, but uh, uh, we're working on many of these issues right now. And uh, we're refining it more and more. And, uh, but, I'm going to shift gears. How are we doing on time, Cornelius? 
15 minutes? 15 minutes? Oh, I'm happy. <laughs> because I think I'm going to get through this because this is kind of the interesting part and this stuff is, is very new. And that, uh, you can see in, in 1922, Gregory said the differences between human population are not very dramatic. And then last lastly, the extravagant hopes for the use of dental features as hallmark of race have not been fulfilled. Poor Lasker. Lasker was the one who invited me to write the Anthropology of Modern Human Teeth. Little did he know that, you know, things were far better than he realized in 57. And in the last paragraph, you don't have to read this, I'll, I'll just tell you what it says. Uh, basically, you know, we gone through all these traits and they were clearly patterned. You know, if you found somebody with winging and shoveling, you definitely knew they were not European or African. And, and we thought, using a combination of traits, you could probably identify an individual's ancestry using uh, more elaborate statistical models or methods, like a neural network based theorem, you know, uh, discriminant analysis, something that random force, things like this. But I say down here, we intended to pursue this avenue of research, but we ran out of both time and space and statistical acumen. We didn't actually have the skill to do that at the time. But have you ever heard the expression, good things come to those who wait? In 2015, I was a Fulbright specialist at the University of Coimbra in Portugal. And I, over a two-week period, I gave many lectures, but the last day was a full-day lecture on tooth granular morphology. And at the end of that day, these two fellows came up, this guy right here, David Navega and Joao Coelho. David's called the genius for good reason. Jow's called Johnny Rabbit for reasons I do not understand. Uh, but they came up to me and said, Professor, we've developed an application based on the appendix in your book where we can estimate the ancestry of individuals based on a combination of traits using Bay a naive Bayes algorithm. I thought, are you kidding me? And I said, that's the most I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. And, and, and they showed me how this thing worked. I thought, you are kidding. And I told David, I said, David, you're gonna make a lot of money on this. And he said, no, Professor Scott, it's going to be freeware. What do you think about that? I love David, he is a wonderful guy. So we started working together and we refined it considerably. This was the original version where you had radio buttons and like 21 samples. I mean, crown and root morphology is good, but it's not quite that good, where you could identify, distinguish, you know, New Guinea and Australia from Melanesia. That's, that's pretty tough, so we refined it. This is the current version, 19 crown traits and six root traits. And there are seven backup traits. This was the big addition. Like uh, in the earlier versions, shovel-shaped incisors, as you can imagine, is a very important trait. And the, in the earlier versions, we used it only on the central incisor. But now, if the central incisors are missing, in fact, I just looked at an individual where there were no central incisors, but there were both lateral incisors. So now we can use lateral incisors as a backup. And we have to have different point estimates, of course, but I have all of that. So we, we have seven backups. So we try to maximize the number of individuals that, uh, that we can score. So this is freeware. You can go to osteomics.com. I'm sure that you know about it, right? He knows about it. He's been, a lot of people have been using this all over the world. That's really cool. These are the traits. I don't need to go over those. But uh, David was able to do a, a, a cluster analysis 
and narrowed this down to seven major groups. Sub-Saharan Africa, Australia, Melanesia, Southeast Asia, Polynesia, Western Eurasia, American Arctic, which is interesting, East Asia, American India. Okay, so you plug in the numbers and you can estimate. This is what it looks like once you plug in a bunch of numbers. The, the prior probability is 0.147 because at the start, every group has an equal probability of being assigned. But then you plug in the traits and you get a posterior probability. We don't have a typicality probability though, yeah. Okay, so let me show you something interesting about this. This, if you go through osteomics and you mark absent for every crown trait, the probability that that's a Western Eurasian is 0.96. That means that there's nothing. You know, no trades, no shoveling, no S6, no deflective wrinkle. All that's a Western Eurasia. On the other hand, if you put in presence for all crown root trades, 0.91 is an East Asian. So they have all the, the trades. Okay, let me quickly show you. I, I had some casts, and I, I've looked at all these before this application was even developed. And the, you can see that Bantu uh, are assigned to Sub-Saharan Africa with secondary and Western Eurasia and Austral Melanesia. That always happens. With the uh, Yendamu, an Australian group, Austral Melanesia, with a little Southeast Asia in Sub-Saharan Africa. American whites, pretty consistent Western Eurasia, with a little Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Asiatic Indian is pretty similar, a little higher sub-Saharan Africa. Chinese, East Asia, and a, a, a little bit of Amur in the American Arctic. Southwest Indians, American Indian, and East Asia. And this is the one that screwed up, Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia has given us nothing but trouble. And I'm going to show you an example of that very quickly. Not quite yet. Okay, this is an article coming out very soon. Uh, <clears throat> the Bayes probability point estimates are based on Christy Turner data. These are based on, uh, this analysis is based on observations I made in Africa and at the body farm in Knoxville, Tennessee and San Marcos, Texas. So we looked at American whites, African blacks, and African Americans in Cape Colored from Cape Town. So when you look at African blacks, you can see about 70% of the time they are assigned to Sub Saharan Africa. And if they're not, 20% to Western Eurasia, rarely to any Asian group. With what American whites, 75% of the time assigned to Western Eurasia, 13% to Sub Saharan Africa, not common to any other group. And look at this African mixed and American black. I could, if I cheated, I, like Donald Trump, I could lie to you, but I'm not, I'm not a liar or a cheater. I can't hardly believe how good this came out. That African mixed, 41% African, American black, 40% African, 29, 32. I mean, it's almost identical. So this is, I know you talked about the interest in mixed populations, and this is the, the kind of thing we've been finding. And uh, so it's pretty interesting. Okay, then we applied this method to the people in the living world. Uh, at one meeting we had these archeologists uh, say these points from Japan look like points from the new world. And so they, they argued pretty strongly that uh, the New World uh, Ancestors came out of Japan. And you can see the title of our article, People Only in the Americas, not out of Japan. Because uh, I knew what Jomo teeth looked like. And Jomo teeth had no resemblance to Native American teeth. And uh, I started off just with a standard uh, uh, distance analysis, just using frequencies. And you can see the Jomo and I knew cluster and then Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Down here it's East Asia, and then all the New World 
populations. You get Eskimo out in the northwest coast to plus to the other. Then I took the pie approach, kind of like a lot of geneticists. They love their pieces of pie. Well, I don't. I guess you can see the colors. Right? Look at Joe Moen. Joe Moen. This this is purple. This is Austral Melanesia, and the red is American Arctic, and the yellow is East Asia. So Joe Moen is primarily a combination of folks coming up this way and coming across there. And that seems to be probably the, the reality of it. The Ainu are, are very similar to the Joe Moen. They're the likely descendants of the Joe Moen. But they have a bigger East Asian component because that, God, I'm sorry, I haven't even been talking into the mic. <laughs> Could you guys hear me? Oh, I'm sorry, Eduardo. Okay, uh, but uh, then you look at uh, China, Mongolia. They have American Indian and Arctic in there. But look at the New World. Here's Arctic, 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 Arctic. And that's Indian, 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 Indian. So Arctic goes down and Indian goes up as you go from north to south in the Americas. But this is American Indian right there with the Joe Moan. So, very unlikely. Then, more recently, we, using the same method with over 1,400 individuals, you have no idea how long this takes me because I have to print off data sheets, then mark the, the ones, with the individuals that have at least 12 traits, and then I have to enter them into an Excel file, a, a template, and then run them, and I'll show you what I get here in a second. But I just did the, this from an earlier paper. But uh, can you see all these numbers? Okay, this is what you get when you run a batch file. And this was for a sample from Arkansas. So uh, Native Americans from Arkansas. And what happens, you get probabilities associated with each of those seven groups. And then the highest probability is noted in this far left column. So East Asia, North and South America, East Asia, et cetera, et cetera. You, you can read that. I'll show you the, the summary. For that particular group, 9 or 20% went with American Arctic, none with Australia Melanesia, 15% East Asia, 55% American Indian, 6.7 Southeast Asia, none Africa, 2.2 Western Eurasia. So this is what you're going to see. I wanted you to see this just so you'd understand the next slide, which <clears throat> is very interesting. Again, these results were not wholly anticipated. Now, I'll talk about Southeast Asia in a minute, but look at East Asia. East Asia is this funky, orangish thing. And then this is Amerindian, this is American Arctic. If you get into the Arctic, here is Am here's East Asia. Here's American Arctic. That's Amherst. <coughs> no, I'm sorry. This is Arctic. This is Amherst. This is Arctic. And then in the Northwest Coast, this is crazy. Northern Maritime, Southern Central Maritime, and Gulf of Georgia. As you go from north to south, the Arctic component goes down, and the Amherst component goes up. Remember, these are the groups that keep falling between American Arctic and American Indian. Then you see North America. Here's the, the Arkansas sample uh, to show you how it looks in this bar chart. But you can see, except for the Iroquois, which is a little weird, all these others are almost identical, and they're almost identical to South America, too. So as you go from north to south, Arctic goes down, Amarin goes up, but East Asia, remains basically exactly the same. And the reason for that is that all of these populations were derived from an East Asian population at one time. And so, for example, say here, here, here's this base population, and then they split. Now my fingers are Am uh, Native Americans, and my thumb, which is crooked, got a hitchhiker's thumb, uh, is the East East Asians. 
And then all of these populations, when they start, start diverging, are actually, or, or are the same distance from East Asians as, well, you see what I mean there. American Arctic, Gamma, and Northwest Coasts are all equally distant from East Asian. And you can see there's a, oops, <coughs> basically a climb of American Arctic going down, 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 uh, from, the, from measured from the Arctic Circle. And uh, just one, this shows that same thing, equ equidistant, or we got at the end. Five minutes. Five minutes? <laughs> God, I don't think I've ever c covered this. And uh, Okay, I'm happy, because I want to talk a little bit about this. Okay, let me take a drink. I've got five minutes. Okay, I've been dealing with uh, morphology for well over 50 years, and I've always been of a mind that these things were not subject to natural selection. Some people, like Al Dahlberg, would argue, well, shovel-shaped shovel incisors, it's like an eye beam that would you know, make your tooth stronger and everything, and that would give you an adaptive advantage. I thought, and winging, for example, is that sexual selection? I mean, do girls really like boys with winging? Or, because face it, the girls make the decisions in that area. Uh, and so, uh, Yuji Mizuguchi, a Japanese colleague, has tried to tie these traits, the mean annual temperature, precipitation, uh, history of daring, and things like that. And I've always been of a mind that, hey, this is genetic drift and uh, founder effect. And you can see gene flow. So you can see those mechanisms, but natural selection, well, not so much. Until Leslie Lusco got me thinking about the signaling pathways involved in develop, dental development. And I read an article uh, by El uh, Irma Theslev, and she talked about the signaling pathways in dental development. And all mammals use these same signaling pathways. And she said something so interesting. She said basically all the differences between, you know, elephants and lions and hippos and cows and primates, it's, it's all tinkering with these different pathways, with different single nucleotide polymorphisms in these pathways. I thought, damn, that is cool. And so, uh, some Japanese scholars found that EDAR, once put one particular SNP uh, in the EDAR pathway, uh, EDAR V370A, uh, was associated with shovel shaped incisors, double shoveling, and lower molar cusp number. I thought, now that is interesting. And then Leslie developed the, the hypothesis that this was. Uh, related to some, some severe selection pressures in the Arctic, not on shovel-shaped incisors, but on uh, breast ducting, uh, vitamin D, uh, fatty acid dehydrogenase, things like that, things that were very important under those severe Arctic conditions. So shovel-shaped incisors, remember, the Chinese have, or the East Asians have quite a bit of shoveling too, but not as much as Native Americans. And so basically, uh, shoveling was pulled along with selection on these other variables. And so now, uh, there's this notion that dental morphological traits, some of them, maybe not all of them, are genetic hitchhikers that are tied to traits. You know, they themselves are not directly influenced by selection. The variables they're associated with are. So this is a pleiotropy, where one gene has multiple effects. And so there are a whole number of these. And so my graduate students and I, we went through uh, Kenneth Kidd's Alfred. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Alfred, which is the allele frequency database. And you go to Alfred, and you enter a, a gene, like you enter EDAR, 
and then it has a few subvariants. But the, but then V378 is just one of many SNPs, and you can go to the others as well. You can go to BNP, FGF, SHH, Sonic Hedgehog. I love that one. You can go to all of these, and it's not just one gene. It's many gene, many SNPs associated with a single gene. And EDAR v 378 my colleagues have tried to explain this to me, uh, EDAR v 378 is a gain of function gene, which, which has an additive effect on the variables it influences. So, uh, so this is what is really exciting, but when we went to Alfred and we plotted out uh, the different SNPs, I thought it blew my mind because here, here's a SNP that, say in Africa, for example, uh, you can see it in frequencies or in histograms. Low, 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 then Europe, boom. And then East Asia may be like that too, or Africa, Europe, Africa, Europe, 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 the Asia, boom. And I saw patterns in these SNPs that parallel very closely the patterns we see in uh, dental morphological variation. And so shoveling is just the tip of the dental iceberg. <laughs> but, so this is what my student is working on right now. We're doing 3D scans of Hispanics in Tucson uh, because Hispanics have a EDAR V378 frequency of 4.43 which is exactly between Europeans, which is zero, and Native Americans, which may be 80 or 90. So it's an exciting time. And one reason I haven't retired yet, because I started working on simple Mendelian genetics. And I'm going out when we know the whole genome. And we can actually tie these traits through GWAS and other ways to you know, really kick the can down the road. But I want to end on this. Give me one minute. Do you see this tooth right here? What does that tooth look like? OK, I'll give you a hint. A vegetable. What vegetable does that look like? I'm telling you, you're the, you're the continent that invented, I mean, uh, domesticated what? Thank you. <laughs> Potatoes. This is a potato tooth. <laughs> this tooth is, this trait is so interesting. You know, I've seen, you know, unfortunately I've not seen it in South America yet, but I've seen it in, well, I did see it in the Chocolate, the Chocolate Cemetery. But uh, this particular tooth, you'll get a kick out of this Cornelius. That is from Krapina. That is a Neanderthal potato food. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2018, I was in China, and uh, one of the paleontologists there showed me this 100,000-year-old fossil, and it had a potato tooth. <laughs> and I said, oh my god, can I take a picture of that? And he said, no, we haven't published yet. <laughs> and I still haven't seen it surface, but uh, uh, potato teeth. You know, I love, you know, I've looked at so many teeth, I love things that are a little bit different. And that's why I'm a little bit different. So, that's it. That's Christy. That's my university in the biggest little city in the world. <laughs> okay, thank you.